All right. Well, thank you, Carla. As uh, as you mentioned, so today we're talking about decarbonizing combustion in steam methane reformers. Um, I'm joined by my colleague James Cross, the global industry manager uh, of hydrocarbon and petrochemical in industries within Amatec Land. Thanks for joining us, James. Thank you, Tim. And so today we'll we'll, we'll share a, a a joint Amatec Land um, offering that really works together to decarbonize steam methane reformers. And, and build efficiency and safety in, into your SMR. So with that being said, uh, for today's agenda, we're gonna highlight those again, safety and efficiency uh, methods to decarbonize combustion within steam methane reformers. And for our agenda today, we'll talk about global trends driving this, this need for tighter emissions and SMRs. We'll talk about uh, combustion optimization and optimized combustion to reduce those emissions. We'll talk about thermal imaging, um, some, and then we'll highlight some of the Amatec solutions to increase yield and also safety uh, in the process of reducing emissions. So as Carla mentioned, feel free to, to post your question in the chat during the presentation, and also feel free to um, ask a question at the end. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of, of this session. Now to get started, let's talk first about some of the global trends that we're seeing right now. And so right now, there's a global movement towards decarbonization, both Governments and corporations globally are evaluating their role in climate control, and in, in doing so, they're looking at reducing greenhouse emission gases, specifically carbon carbon dioxide, among other emissions. And that being said, combustion will still remain important across many industries. Um, there are certain industries that are very hard to decarbonize and that rely heavily on high temperatures, such as steel, cement, and chemicals that require some type of combustion process in addition to mobility solutions, such as aerospace. So those together, there's still gonna be a need for combustion and, and for heat and power in the future. And as we look ahead, large scale decarbonization has come up in many different ways for combustion. Um, there's flue gas, carbon capture to produce carbons, carbon emissions after a combustion process. There's, there's changing fuels. There's all different ways. There's, there's a number of different ways in order to reduce carbon through carbon capture. Um, there's also electric, electrification as one way to generate heat in place of combustion, and that works in many cases, um, except where there might be very high temperatures that require that may be better suited for a fuel instead. But electrification is certainly a large scale decarbonization method. And then there's also hydrogen fuels as one way to generate heat without carbon emissions. So altogether, as we look ahead, combustion still remains very important for our future, and that's why we look and collaborate today on how we can decarbonize um, some steam methane reformer combustion processes. Thanks, Tim. So talking about hydrogen, okay. there's obviously a huge amount of investment in new hydrogen infrastructure. But what's interesting in the ammonia production, in the methanol production, in the refinery hydrogen production uh, industries, a lot of this technology has existed and I would say the majority of new plants since probably 2008, 2009 has already included CO2 capture with an efficiency of up to uh, 80 to 90 percent. Um, so they can capture that CO2 already. When we when we talk about the hydrogen um, industry, more than 95 percent of the world's hydrogen is produced using an SMR. So there will be more SMRs being built over the next 20 to 30 years. And then what we're really talking about today is how do we increase the efficiency both of those existing SMRs and on uh, new SMRs going forward. We're not so much talking about green hydrogen, even though it will play an important role in the hydrogen uh, network in the future. So like I said, we're talking more on the existing assets. So as the energy transition focus on that migration to hydrogen fuels, how do we how do we increase the efficiency of those existing assets? So Tim will talk a little bit about how we lower those O2 levels to reduce the total emissions. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we can get some of that efficiency to reduce those emissions through increased uh, efficiency. We're, we're not so much talking about reduced flaring and carbon capture today, but that also plays a, a crucial role in how we can get some of that efficiency uh, up. All right, thank you, James. So for today's presentation, we're gonna talk specifically about 
the steam methane reformer within the steam methane reforming process. And so as you can kind of tell here, the steam methane reformer requires a combustion process for the in order to heat the tubes of the combustion reaction to basically convert the, the methane in the hydrogen, the methane in the steam in order to on a catalyst in order to generate hydrogen. So in order to, in order to do that, you need some type of combustion process in order to hot, heat it hot enough for it to crack methane and generate hydrogen and, and send gas. So in this particular sense, combustion is critical for the steam methane reforming process. And, and even further, I do want to make everybody aware that there are other configurations for steam methane reformers. And in this particular case, it's a vertical downfired um, burner, but there are different configurations for steam methane reformers. So it's side fired, there's, there's terrace fired, there's top fired, there's bottom fired. And for today, we're going to talk about, we're going to show the image of the top fired, but all these principles will resonate completely with the other burner arrangements. So anything talked about here can also apply to the other versions of SMRs in industry and, and across the world. Now that being said, we're going to focus primarily on the steam methane reforming process and the steam methane reformer. And we're going to look at what can make it greener. How do we decarbonize? How do we remove carbon emissions? And how do we design for efficiency and safety in the process? So part of it is, is there's going to be two principles. There's two principles that we're going to highlight in today's presentation. Combustion optimization and two ball and two ball temperature monitoring, and together these these two measurement points will provide very helpful for these these two principles will be very helpful for uh, understanding better how do we reduce carbon emissions from SMRs and do that with efficiency and safety. So I'll talk next about combustion optimization. So for combustion optimization, combustion ultimately requires three things. You need oxygen, you need oxygen, fuel, and heat. And that's a basic principle of the fire triangle. Remove any one of these and you can't make a flame. So that's critical for, for combustion. Now, in any combustion process, you're going to generate some amount of incomplete combustion. And we call that combustibles. And generally, combustibles take the form of carbon monoxide and hydrogen as, as a form of incomplete combustion. And these incomplete combustion can be a result of poor mixing or changing loads in the, in the, in the fuel itself or manufacturing you know, malfunctioning burners any, or variable fuels, anything that could really cause a disruption in the, in the flame envelope that causes a spot where there's incomplete oxygen to the methane molecule, causing it to go to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So when we think about that, from my standpoint, there's there are four relevant combustion measurements in any type of combustion application. And that's excess oxygen that provides the set point for your burner and fuel ratio to make sure that you have the right burner and fuel ratio for combustion control. Um, there's also the combustible measurement, which ensures that you are operating safely and also efficiently to save fuel. And we'll talk about that even more so in this presentation. Uh, there's also a methane and hydrocarbons measurement that we recommend that will allow you to determine if you have any unburnt methane escaping from the burner for whatever reason, loss of, of a fuel leak or loss of flame, so that you can detect those gas leaks early um, by having a methane detector. And then finally, I also recommend that we also recommend that you have a sample flow measurement to ensure that you have an accurate representation of your process. You don't want to be sampling, you don't want to apply measurement without having some reference to whether or not it's an accurate representation of your process. So we also recommend the sample flow, especially in, in cleaner applications that allow you to ensure that you have a representative, representative sample uh, for what you're measuring. Now all that considered, let's talk about the combustion process. Now in perfect conditions, we call it stoichiometric combustion. And stoichiometric combustion is the ideal case where you have methane reacting with exactly the right amount of oxygen to generate carbon, di carbon dioxide in water. Now, in this case, you have perfect efficiency. You have <laughs> perfect heat transfer, and, and that allows you to get the maximum useful heat transfer to the tubes. 
Now, the one thing I want to point out is that in stoichiometric con combustion, there is no excess oxygen in these perfect conditions because all of that oxygen is consumed. And so when I talk about measuring excess oxygen, in the case of stoichiometric conditions, there's no excess oxygen. All of the oxygen that was available in the beginning was fully consumed to create carbon dioxide in, in water. However, in reality, in the, in, in, in the real world, we actually have to operate slightly excess oxygen. We have to add slightly additional excess air to the burner so that we have some type of safety margin. And so in that case, we generate some low levels of, carb of combustibles. Like that's just normal. There's, there's always some low level of combustibles in any process. And by, as, as a result, it's a little bit less efficient because you're heating this oxygen on the outlet. You're also have generating combustibles. But in doing so, you're also safer. So I want you to notice again that there's a slight X amount of oxygen in the, in the flue gas after the reaction takes place. But that also, that excess oxygen provides a mechanism for safety. So we have the oxygen measurement and we have these combustible measurements that are available as well. And we can monitor these for safety. So I'll go further. So this is normal excess oxygen operation. Now, unless your heater is designed for reducing environments and oxygen deficient environments and fuel rich conditions, um, otherwise these are a fuel rich condition is actually a very serious matter. It's actually a very dangerous scenario. And what happens is, say you have a loss of flame or say you have a burner uh, that has a, a fuel leak. In this case, the there could be an excess amount of fuel that enters that enters the, the firebox, which not only creates high amount of high amount of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, but also it's it's also fuel rich condition. There's no excess oxygen available, so you generate high amounts of carbon monoxide and high amounts of hydrogen as a part of incomplete combustion, and you're also severely less efficient. So this is certainly a safety issue as much as it is an efficiency loss scenario. So this is something to be mindful of because if you get too high in combustibles, that's an unsafe condition potentially. So let's talk about efficiency losses. So as you operate hotter and hotter, as you operate higher and higher levels of excess oxygen, as you go away from documentary conditions, because at perfect conditions you have no excess oxygen, as you go further and out for, for safety, you also have increases of inefficiency. You also lose efficiency over time. You lose efficiency with greater amounts of excess oxygen levels. So that's one thing to be aware of as you as you operate higher excess oxygen, you're basically just heating the air on the outlet. And that heating air requires you to fire more fuel, which generates more emissions. Now, that's when you look at from the standpoint of the excess oxygen. When you look at it, from it, from an excess um, air standpoint. When you look at it from an from a combustible standpoint, as you operate lower and lower excess oxygen levels, your combustibles become an issue. After a certain point, and this is for illustrative purposes, but after a certain point, you generate extremely high levels of combustibles, and that represents um, a loss of efficiency as well. The, those that, that gets you closer and closer to unsafe conditions. And there's this point in the middle called combustible breakthrough where you go from a safe increases to an astronomical increase, an, ex an exponential increase in, in combustible levels. And that that's also represents an efficiency loss. But when you put them together, if you just monitored oxygen by itself, if you just had an oxygen measurement, an excess oxygen measurement, what that would provide is a set point. You'd at least know that, okay, all the time, if you're at this level, as long as you're above 0% oxygen, your set point at 2% safe in this example, that should be safe enough where you're far enough away from combustible breakthrough, but you're also not um, too far where you're incurring too many losses of having high excess air to your burner. So that's just monitoring oxygen by itself. But when you also measure combustibles, you have two mechanisms to to determine an optimal control set point that may be a lot lower than your original than your original auction only set point. And so this this optimal control set point 
driven by the combustible measurement and the oxygen measurement gives you what we call combustion optimization or a point where you're at a safe you're at a safe location for your oxygen set point you're at a safe location for your combustible set point and you're also lowering your fuel consumption you're also reducing emissions so that's one way to to decarbonize from that standpoint so again measuring oxygen by itself provides an operating set point measuring combustibles minimizes efficiency losses which allow you to reduce fuel consumption reduce emissions and avoid unsafe conditions from combustibles breakthrough so that's the overview of combustion optimization but when we think about it what does this look like in real life well this also looks like a series of, of gauges you're monitoring the excess oxygen concentration make sure that it doesn't go too too low you're also monitoring combustibles make sure they don't go too hot now from a from an Amatec solution standpoint uh, one thing that we recommend is we recommend monitoring for excess oxygen and we might recommend monitoring for combustibles and we also recommend a third measurement of hydrocarbons methane hydrocarbons um, to to monitor for potential you know, fuel leaks at the burner and also um, loss of flame. So together, we recommend the, the Thermox WG5 analog, combustion analyzer for these cases. And in so doing, it provides a mechanism to decarbonize team methane reformers by ensuring optimal, you know, optimized combustion, combustion optimization, which produces, which ensures fuel efficiency, also reduces emissions and um, the W5 itself has a lot of mechanisms in order to design for safety. By having a combustible measurement, you can monitor for incomplete combustion, monitor for combustibles. For with a with a methane hydrocarbon detector, you can monitor for fuel leaks and loss of flame. Also, from a safety standpoint, the WG5 itself is designed with a lot of redundancies and diagnostics for safety systems. So if the burning management system has to be so rated, um, we have redundancies and diagnostics available for those safety systems. And more than that, the WG5 itself is, is a compact design. It actually mounts on the process flange, and that provides fast responses because it's close coupled and it's extracted. It's actively pulling a sample, which gives you faster responses and no need for, uh, no, unnecessary, no extra need for heated sample line or sample conditioning. So for that, we, rec we recommend that the Thermox WG5 as an Amtec solution to decarbonize the steam methane perform our process through combustion optimization. Now, all that being said, uh, again, we're focusing on how do we how do we decarbonize team methane reformers? And so we just talked about how combustion optimization works. But now let's kind of turn the focus to two ball temperature. Because of the two principles we talked about, combustion optimization, two ball temperature, when you start to reduce your oxygen excess oxygen concentration that increases your combustibles level but that also increases your two ball temperatures and so in the in the in the spirit of monitoring of monitoring for safety and also ensuring energy efficiency we we let now look towards how do we ensure that we're not operating too low excess oxygen level that may be causing uh, an integrity issue on our two balls. So let's pass it over to James to talk about two ball temperature monitor. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I'm really happy that we we finally found a way to talk about these two topics together. And it is a um, it, it is a prevalent topic at the moment, because as you said, as customers are trying to get that overall efficiency up, by reducing their oxygen set points and therefore, like you said, increasing their tube ball temperatures, they're asking more questions on, is the tube ball temperature value accurate? And on the flip side, when customers do measure high tube ball temperatures, <clears throat> they often lean off the atmosphere, so go for higher oxygen set points, which is a really inefficient way to run, um, as Tim explained. So a good understanding of tube ball temperatures and on the accuracy of those measurements is, is really important. And we often talk about the window, the operating window that the operator um, sits in. Um, that's in Fahrenheit on the right hand side. But generally speaking, if you're 
above that um, operating window, if you're above the design limit of the tube, uh, you're going to have a short lifetime on the tube. If you're below that, you're going to lose production. If you're inaccurate with those readings, that's a whole other issue. So if you're reading inaccurately high, what you might have is a high CH4 slip because you're not running at the temperature you think you're running and the catalytic reaction is lower than it should be. You're going to have a margin loss because you've got low plant yield. You're not using all the all the methane that you could be in that reaction. And you're going to chase false alarms. You're going to think there's serious issues and potentially invest a lot in fixing those issues when those really didn't exist. And then if you're inaccurate on the low side, you may have safety issues because you're running hotter, you're overheating tubes, you're damaging and rupturing tubes. You'll have poor reliability, margin loss again via reliability because of those overheated tubes and most most calculations on on standard alloy tubes will will look at a 10 years loss of lifetime if you're 20 or 30 degrees uh, over temperature we're talking more about the inside surface of tubes whereas tim was talking about the combustion atmosphere that you can see on that diagram to your right what we're talking about is the internal temperatures of those reformer tubes so the whole point of that combustion atmosphere is to provide heat for that reaction that's going on inside the tubes and where you can see that inlet manifold that contains steam and methane which is passed over a catalyst heated to produce our outlet gas so one of the big challenges and one of the big causes of overheating tubes and ultimately of inefficiency is carbon itself. So you can have carbon sitting on the inside of that tube, um, which can be caused by a, a low steam to carbon uh, ratio, i.e. a rich process gas. You can have he heavy hydrocarbons in feedstocks, which is more of an issue as gas wells approach the end of their useful life. The catalyst activity drops and when that drops, the inside tube wall temperature and the process gas temperature increases and then the carbon formation rate exceeds the carbon gasification rate so you get uh, a carbon or graphite sitting on the surface of the wall that cannot be gasified into uh, co and co2 you could have issues with the catalyst or the loading or damage or poisoning to that catalyst insufficient purging of the residual hydrocarbons prior to the restart of the furnace or you could have uh, an incident um, or a complete loss of a loss of steam that, that normally becomes visible and the carbon formation normally becomes visible as a as a hot band. It could be a, an entirely hot tube, but it normally is visible as a hot band. And I'm sure most people that have had a thermal image or even a, a look through peep doors are familiar with that type of um, more, more significant hot band. What happens once you get that hot band is a kind of a vicious cycle. So you get a reduced inside tube wall heat transfer coefficient. So less heat transfer from that furnace atmosphere to the gas on the inside of the tube. You get reduced interpellate heat transfer coefficient uh, in the catalyst. So there's reduced catalyst activity as the active nickel sites in the catalyst are covered by carbon and they're a lower temperature now. You get an increase in the resistance to the flow through the tube, so a, a pressure drop, there, thereby decreasing the heat sink available and further increasing the tube wall temperature. So you get this kind of runaway reaction where a tube overheats. What happens when a single tube overheats is that that uh, higher temperature radiates onto the nearby tube. So you can often have banks or batches of tubes which are overheated. So then what happens which affects our fuel efficiency is that producers reduce the firing around those individual tubes or that bank of tubes, but they still need to hit the same production uh, values. So they'll increase the general level of firing, um, which actually has the knock on effect of causing overheating risks on other tubes. So you can get the same effect um, in other tubes. So you can actually uh, have a have a significant impact on the overall efficiency of the furnace if you have these what are initially smaller issues so monitoring for those and measuring those hot bands accurately should help uh, prevent this type of, um, uh, of runaway reaction so reducing the severity of coking and hot bands can have a significant impact on on your total efficiency so the cost of that once you start to uh, rupture ultimately melt tubes is, is pretty significant 
Um, and again, when we talk about efficiency, we're normally talking about cost. So if, if you're if you're wasting methane essentially either through a higher methane slip or through higher oxygen set points, uh, which mean uh, you're running your, at a low low fuel efficiency level, that's a cost. And then on the other side, the cost is if you overheat the tubes is significant as well. So we found with customers where we've helped to identify when tubes are overheating that the costs can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, and by avoiding that, we can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost opportunity avoidance. We, we did a, a small um, um, report with Ammonia Know-How and they informed us that 22% of equipment failures in the ammonia industry causing shutdowns uh, of course, primary syn gas reformers, SMRs, are fundamental in the ammonia manufacturing process. 22% of those equipment failures involve the primary syn gas reformers, and more than 50% of those failures involve tubal temperature excursions. Um, so it's a very common cause, both of inefficiency and of uh, reliability issues. So by optimising those tubal temperatures, hydrogen producers have reported a 2% increase in production whilst operating in that uh, safe condition within that window. So how do we do that? And and uh, many of you will be familiar with this. So I'll recap quickly on the on the products that we use and the products that are used in the industry. So you can have a handheld cyclops. So that's uh, industry wide uh, pyrometer. It's used manually in most cases. Um, there are Bluetooth apps that are used to collect that data. But in many cases, customers go around and manually collect that data put that into a spreadsheet. Um, what we advise doing is collecting that data with an emissivity of one and then doing background correction uh, after either in software or in a spreadsheet, as many people do. So you collect your raw temperature values, you collect background temperature values, and then you'll input the emissivity of the tube, which may change very slightly over time. And we'll come back to that. And then you'll have your total, uh, your, your uh, corrected values. One, one thing we've noticed, which which has a bigger effect on the accuracy of the values than I than I first imagined, is the peep door cooling effect. And there's literature on this. And in many cases, like in those charts on the lower side, the impact is negligible, um, where you can have a five or six degree C, uh, so 11 or uh, 12 or 13 degree F uh, uh, drop in temperatures as you open the peep door. But we've actually spoken to customers that will see a 40 to 45 degree C with a 45 minute recovery of those temperatures. So what that would do, going back to the introductory slide, is give you a very false high reading, uh, sorry, false low reading. So you would have temperatures which you might measure at 750, but that's because those tubes are being cooled by the peep door. So the real running temperature might be 800 or closer to 800. So that would be... Uh, in some cases, a cause of significant concern. So we need to monitor that peep door cooling effect before we take our readings, and that will help us get more accurate values from our reports. We use the gold cup as well as a reference temperature method, and that helps us, coming back to emissivity, that helps us calculate the emissivity of the tube. That gold hemisphere on the, on the end of that probe uh, gives us a near black body effect on the tube. So that has the effect of enhancing the emissivity through those multiple reflections to the point that we get over 99% emissivity on that tube. So we can use that reference value to kind of reverse calculate what we think the emissivity of the tubes that we're measuring is. It also has the effect of eliminating the site path. So a pyrometer, a handheld pyrometer, um, doesn't know what site path is uh, in between the target and the pyrometer whereas the gold cup doesn't have that issue, it's held right against the tube, and it also doesn't see the background. Um, so you can see on point C on this chart that as the pyrometer, as the gold cup pyrometer approaches the tube, you get a change in the temperature value, so we know that that uh, gold cup pyrometer is no longer seeing any background reflections. Therefore, we can use that reference value, not just to correct for emissivity, but also for background reflections. So it's used as part of a suite of tools to really see what's happening and to see how uh, efficiently an SMR is operating. 
Another one of those tools is the thermal imaging camera. So more widely used on SMRs nowadays than, than when I first started looking at SMRs, say five or six years ago. And we can air purge that lens to keep the tip temperature low. But importantly, we also have a boroscope lens. That means that it's not held just like a mobile phone outside the peep door, which would give you a very limited uh, field of view. We actually insert that peep door. We actually insert that boroscope through the peep door with the air cooling so that you've got the benefits of that wide angle field of view. Um, and we've seen a growing demand for that. Uh, where where some expertise has left left the industry, um, it's it's a it's a pretty good tool to um, figure out what's happening on the inside of a reformer and and spot phenomena that might not be visible to the to the human eye. And lens options is, a, is an interesting one and a, a frequent debate we have. So with a narrower lens, you can get more resolution on tubes further away from the peep door as a as a general rule. So that means that on some top fired reformers, where you've got, say, up to 32, sometimes 48 tubes in a single row, you really want to see what's happening with those tubes further away from the camera. So you might, in that case, choose to have a narrower uh, lens. But with some reformers, you might want to use a wider angle lens because you can then see a lot more with a single scene. And if you scan with using that scene, you can really see a huge amount uh, from a single peep door. What you can do once you've collected that data, again, combining the reference data from the Gold Cup, combining the Cyclops data and thermal images, you can start to get both horizontal uh, uniformity data across single planes. So that uh, tab uh, table data is a single plane, so at a single peep door level, corrected tube temperature values. So we're looking where the hottest uh, tubes are in that reformer, and that will give us an idea of how, how well the reformer is balanced at that time. What you can also do is then vertically measure the temperature across uh, the length of the tube to see where the uh, hottest, hottest uh, sections of that tube are, and that will help you with the understanding of the reaction inside the tube. So we're looking for really broad temperature data corrected accurately to tell us how we can adjust firing or adjust uh, ratios on uh, steam to carbon ratios in the tubes to get that optimum level where we're running efficiently and safely. What we've also seen with boroscope technology is the ability to go into places that you may not have been able to get measurements from before. So for example, on a hot collector, we can see what the temperatures of those tubes are. And when you can do that, you can see if there's any hot bands and potential for failures, because that is an area where leaks are common. This one's not on the right hand side. You can see a video just to show how the boroscope gives you that wide angle view once you go into the peep door. That one's on a cracker, but it's a similar view that you'd get on, a, on an SMR, a side fired SMR especially. Another thing that helps with the efficiency of the furnace is monitoring for air leaks. So you can see on the left image and on that right image, this is on a terrace wall um, uh, furnace design. You can see where we've got really significant air ingress around the tube seals. And I think the, the customer at this point knew that there was an issue with these uh, with these tubes because they were firing more than they would, would previously have to to achieve the same temperatures. But what we showed is that tube temperatures near those seals were in the in the low kind of 400 to 500 degrees C range. So really way, way, way below what they would need to be uh, measuring to, to know that they're operating efficiently. So. We can monitor those air leaks both from the inside of the furnace using a boroscope and we can also do that externally using uh, using uh, different cameras which are mounted outside the furnace. But by reducing those air leaks and reducing cold air ingress into the furnace, we can also really help with the fuel efficiency, ultimately helping with decarbonisation. And then we can also put fixed thermal imaging cameras onto those furnaces so we can mount those cameras to the sides of uh, the furnace cases. How we do that depends on the furnace design. 
Uh, top fire designs generally require a good number of cameras, whereas side fire designs, if you see on the top right hand image, means that normally we can install a fewer number of cameras to get coverage of uh, a real high number of tubes. But by doing that, we can really continuously optimize uh, firing and we can continuously monitor any changes in the homogeneity of those tube temperature values. And then the question going forward, we talk, we're talking about decarbonisation here, but another industry trend is obviously digitalisation and those things do overlap. If we can take those temperature values and there's millions of those data points collected every second, how do we turn those uh, imaging streams and those uh, temperature data points into an automated system which optimises the furnace monitoring and control? Um, so that's the challenge for the future of the industry is how some of these cloud-based pattern recognition and analysis uh, algorithms are used. Can we increase the closed loop control to really uh, uh, continuously improve the efficiency of that furnace and then also use real time correction of those models and simulations um, in our software? So there are challenges going forward, which should really get the overall total efficiency of these furnaces really uh, up, which should which should help blue hydrogen compete with the uh, reducing price of some of the hydrogen produced by other methods. So, Tim, if you want to quickly summarize how we can help uh, overall. Sure, we can tag team it. But thanks for talking through that, James. It's it's amazing to see how it's amazing to see how thermal imaging can really complement the safety aspect of of steam methane reformers, but also the efficiency. <laughs> so, um, thanks for sharing that. It's 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 still amazing to see how how it plays so well together. So. Um, now we're going to just talk about some of the Emtech solutions. You know, how can we help uh, support your process? And we kind of hinted at all these things, but just in one place. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we offer the Thermox WG5 combustion analyzer in Emtech process instruments, and that allows you to to measure up to three measurements in one: excess oxygen, combustibles, and hydrocarbon for for safety, so that you can reduce your fuel, causing allowing you to reduce your emissions through uh, combustion optimization. So the WG5, it's it's compact design. It's also readily mountable, like you can mount it directly to the process flange. And we have a various number of configurations, floor mounted, remote mounted, um, wall mounted designs um, available, among others, uh, to really tailor to whatever process nozzles you have on your steam methane reformer. And we've also designed the WG5 intentionally around uh, having safety integrity level redundancies and, and diagnostics to support any burner management system that is using a safety system type um, diagnosis as a safety system uh, rating. So that being said, um, so that's the WG5 highly recommended for combustion optimization. And then James, I don't know if you want to highlight the uh, Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was I was really interested, as you know, in your in your seal rating on the uh, WD, WDG5. Um, I thought that was a really interesting uh, development on that product. On the uh, on the NIRB and the MWIRB and the Gold Cup, I'll summarize real quick. The NIRB and MWIRB is the camera itself. So that's the near infrared and the mid wave infrared uh, boroscope camera itself. So then that's supplied with a range of cooling uh, jacket assemblies, flange mount, and different purge options. Air, air cooling, water cooling. So we've got a whole load of um, accessories that come with that. But essentially, the, the key technology is the is the wide dynamic range cameras itself. And obviously, we cover a huge range of temperatures for that. Um, on, on the Gold Cup, we're the still, I believe, unique manufacturer of that. So we're the only people that make that globally. And it's a kind of, um, it's not the easiest tool in the world to use. And nobody will mind me saying that. It's three meters long. It's water cooled. So it's a pretty ugly tool, but it's uh, it's the only thing to do what it what it can do, um, and that accuracy, like I hoped I uh, covered, is is pretty important for us. All right, so thank you, James. So really, just as a highlight, we're we're going to summarize in two slides. So this slide, just really to highlight what were we were talking about with respect to the fired heater, and what are we talking about with respect to the steam methane reforming process. So we talked about. You know, how do you decarbonize? Well, decarbonization really comes from safety and it comes from efficiency. Efficiency by directly reducing emissions caused by fuel 
or caused by, um, you know, methane slip, but and also safety so that you can maintain uptime and so that you don't have any type of unsafe conditions or things that may cause downtime or uh, an undesirable event. So that being said, we really just wanted to frame it out for what are we talking about as far as like the fire teeter aspect of the steam methane reformer and the steam methane reforming process. So I'll just highlight the, the fire teeter perspective real quick. So as we mentioned, we talked about efficiency and efficiency really comes from that combustion optimization. Um, by lowering the excess oxygen level, you're reducing the amount of fuel consumed at the burner and reducing the amount of fuel consumed at the, at the burner also reduces your carbon emissions. And so in combination with a combustibles measurement, you're able to optimize that air to fuel ratio at the burner. And that really helps the efficiency and also the, the ability to reduce your emissions within a steam methane reformer. Now on the safety side of things, as I mentioned, the combustibles measurement allows you to monitor for incomplete combustion. The methane hydrocarbons, me uh, methane hydrocarbons measurement allows you to monitor for fuel rich conditions and also for any potential loss of flame or fuel leak conditions. So in addition to being designed, like designing for still safety integrity levels and, and for SIS systems, uh, these are some of the things that I look at when I think about like how do you decarbonize a steam methane reformer. Now I'll pass on to you, James, for highlighting around the steam methane reforming process and the tubes themselves. Thanks, Tim. So to, to recap on the SMR side, balancing tube wall temperature spread, that means reducing the delta between your coolest tube and your hottest tube is something you can do with the technology we talked about to increase the uh, overall efficiency. Reducing the methane slip, i.e. the amount of methane going outside the reformer, so using as much of that methane in the process as we can. And then monitoring for those increases early in the uh, runaway reaction so that we can get that heat transfer coefficient where it needs to be and reducing the likelihood of tube issues going on to safety. That's monitoring for leaks or leaks in the feedstock or leaks in the fuel, which could be through um, uh, issues with the furnace refractory, monitoring for high burner tip temperatures, and then also for tube ruptures and hot spots on those tubes. Yeah, James, I can't remember if you mentioned or not, but but you mentioned uh, we we talked about this earlier, but you mentioned that you can direct the camera at the burner itself and monitor the actual burner tips. You've actually right. had experience like monitoring for for a loss of flame as well. Correct. So that's that's a big advantage of the 3.9, the MWIRB mid-wave infrared boroscope. If we point that at a burner, and you've generally got good opportunities to do that on most furnace designs, especially uh, vertical cylindrical uh, reformer designs, you can point that camera right at a burner to see what level of fouling you have or to, to look at the condition of the tip itself. From, from an automated perspective, if you're using a camera to monitor that burner tip, and we, we talked about this, you can set an alarm around that burner tip. And what we, what, we, what we typically see is that that burner tip will increase in temperature if a burner goes out, because there's no gas there to cool that tip temperature. So on the portable and the fixed side, using the, uh, using the camera to monitor those uh, burner temperatures and the condition of that burner tile is is kind of an area that we were a bit surprised by, but it seems to be quite widely ado adopted now. Yeah, it's just interesting. You could you can use measurements to monitor for high high methane high hydrocarbon in the fuel box in the firebox. But in combination with with two with um, thermal imaging, you can also visualize that. So it could be two different progressive functions or two different ways to monitor for the same thing. Uh, that redundancy is only giving you even more early uh, detection of any type of unsafe condition. So thanks for highlighting that, James. All right, so just just to, as, as key takeaways, I know we just give you highlights, but it's just key, key, key takeaways from this presentation. You know, certainly there is uh, a global movement towards reducing greenhouse gases in order to combat climate, climate change. And in the process, combustion will still remain very important in our future. And so as we look towards a hydrogen type economy, and hydrogen as a is a fuel of the future. We also look at how do we support steam methane reformers in the installed base that are currently the backbone of a 
this this hydrogen economy. So really looking at how do we support steam methane reformers, existing assets, and provide you know solutions for efficiency and also for safety. So as I mentioned, you know with with combustion optimization, you can reduce you reduce the excess oxygen levels in the in the flue gas, and that in turn reduces fuel consumption, which reduces emissions, and allows you to also monitor for safety. And uh, James, I don't know if you want to add anything else on the thermal imaging side. But I'll give you. Yeah, yeah, I'll wrap it up real quick because so that we've got time for some questions. Um, just summarizing what I said before: accurate thermal imaging, and the accurate is the really important part of those TWTs, helps to ensure no hotspots, re uh, reduction of rupture points of tubes, and then ensuring uptime, reliability, and safety. And then. What, what we're trying to do by this uh, collaboration between PI and LAND is really increase that combined understanding of gas analysis and TWTs so that we can increase that balance, the, the overall efficiency and combustion safety. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to co-present, Tim. I appreciate your support, James. It's, um, so we recently re released a brochure around this as well, if anybody would like to catch it on either of our websites. Um, but as we move forward, we also give space for questions. So um, feel free to add questions into the chat. Um, Carla, if you've seen any questions in the chat, feel free to, to let us know. But we have time for, for questions if, if there are any. Don't see anything coming through in chat. If you're comfortable unmuting yourself and asking a question verbally, you can do that as well. All right. Well, one one question that I typically get when it comes to combustion optimization is, is is there any right oxygen set point? Is there any right excess oxygen set point? And just to give an answer to that question, the answer is it really depends on the process. Even with the steam methane reformer, it really depends because it, it de depends on you know your burn arrangement, depends on your uh, type of fuel that you're using, depends on uh, a number of variables, and I mean, it, especially if your if your if your fuel changes, like say you're putting your flaring your flare gas into your main main header and putting that to the burner, that could absolutely change the the the, the what it takes to to create a stoichiometric condition. So uh, while I showed you some examples of combustion optimization and some set points, you know, really it depends on the combustion process itself. So Doing some internal testing to see like what what is a safe set point? Is it one percent oxygen? Is it two percent oxygen? And monitoring for combustibles, make sure you're not too high or too low. So there is no fixed value for any specific excess oxygen concentration in any fired equipment, steam methane reformer or otherwise. Hey, hey Tim, I'll I'll ask you a question because um, it it's one that that I get from our team that visit sites where the producer that we're meeting has a Amatec PI instrument. I feel like this is more like one of our chats, more like a podcast uh, at this point. <laughs> but um, so so the question is around mounting the analyzers. So if if say you're unfamiliar with the with the Amatec analyzers, but you've seen the oxygen set point reading on the DCS or in the control room, where should you look for those analyzers? Where are they typically mounted on a on an SMR? Oh, that's a great question, James. So, I, so the American Petroleum Institute API they have a recommended practice five five six that recommends that the combustion analyzer uh, be located as close to the radiant section as possible. Um, Right before the convective section, so so what that means is you need enough space after the burner for the to combustion process to take to to progress, but you also don't want to you also don't want to uh, you, know, you don't want to put the, the the oxygen analyzer so close to the flame that it's in the flame and it could get in a, a reading that's mid combustion like you would like you may have high oxygen you may have low oxygen because it's in the middle of the flame. So you need to give enough space, and typically it's at the end of that radiant section that we recommend putting it. And um, by putting it right at the end of the, ex the radiant section, you also reduce any potential for for tramp air or ingress air to uh, to 
interfere with that oxygen reading as well. So that's that's my general answer for any type of fire heater as well. Just right after the radiant section, but not too close to the flames or be in the flames, but not so far away that it would cause any type of ingress air uh, interference with the oxygen reading. Yeah, good question. That's great. No, that, that's great. That answers that. Thank you very much. OK. All right, Carla, do you see any other questions, Carla? I do not. So uh, we will go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thanks again for attending today's session. We hope you found it informative. Uh, thank you, Tim and James, for sharing your expertise. Uh, I've posted some useful links for products and local contacts related to today's presentation in the chat. And as mentioned before, uh, this session uh, was recorded and uh, we will be sending you out a notification within the next day or two uh, with a link to Amatech Process Instruments YouTube page that will have that recording. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, James. And feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, everyone.